Good evening, everybody. My name is Andy Finney. I'm the producer on the project. And uh, the original technical lead, Peter Armstrong, and I uh, um, helped get things off the ground. And then I moved over to let someone who could actually do it manage the project side of it. What's going to happen this evening is there's going to be a panel um, discussion moderated by Bill Thompson from the BBC uh, with um, four of the key members of the team. And then we'll throw it open to a Q&A. There are other team members and associates around. So once we get into Q&A, we'll probably widen the discussion a bit. But for now... It would be impossible to keep them quiet. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but for now, I'll hand you over to Bill Thompson. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Andy, and uh, thanks for inviting me to, to do this. Um, for those who don't, me, don't know me, I'm a long-term Cambridge resident. Uh, I appear weekly, or most weeks, on a radio show on BBC World Service called Digital Planet. It used to be called Click, it used to be called Go Digital, but it's currently Digital Planet. Um, where we talk about technology and how it's changing the world and changing people's lives. But most crucially for this, uh, in 86 or 88, I worked at Acorn Computers where I was uh, working with Mike Chalice on the internal database systems. So I helped install the first CAD system uh, at Acorn um, and worked in the engineering department and got to know some great people. So I have a, a particular interest and of course, every time I come into this room, the presence of the, the micros and the Archimedes brings back that wave of not quite PTSD, but certainly <laughs> somewhere on that scale that we've all come to recognise. And yeah, I feel reach out for a co-processor somewhere. Um, I was therefore very aware of the Doomsday Project from its inception and followed it. And then I was lucky enough to be a colleague uh, and good friend of Al Mansfield, who's around somewhere, or has vanished, or is getting wine. Oh, there you are. Um, um, and therefore was very aware of the uh, Doomsday Reloaded efforts uh, because as well as my night job on the radio, I have a day job. I used to work in the BBC archives as the archive uh, development uh, manager and now I work in BBC research and development to try to think of futures for the BBC that don't involve linear broadcast television. And if the BBC has a future that doesn't involve linear broadcast television, then it will trace its heritage all the way back to Doomsday as a, a real serious effort at building something that was not television in the days where the vast majority of people inside the BBC and elsewhere could imagine little else. And so it's a real privilege to, to be here with, say, as uh, we heard, four people who were involved right from the start, just to, to review what this thing was, that I imagine we all know quite well, where it came from, what we've learned from it, and um, what fun we had along the way, I think was the way it was phrased to me. Um, as in that it was actually sort of quite an adventure for, for all of you. So I think we should start by, if I could ask you just to introduce yourselves, uh, starting with you, Peter, and just the, the, the capsule summary of, of your, your engagement in the project. You're allowed to say everything at this point. Um, well, thank you, it's very nice to be here. It feels a bit quaint actually seeing that's a trip back into the strange, uh, very, very distant past with the way technology has changed and the way the data has become so important now, but in a somewhat ambivalent way as to how valuable it... We were very innocent in thinking those days about the value of data and the wonderful way in which citizens could all import things and they'd all be very public-spirited and it would be wonderful. So it all does feel a little bit like another age. Anyway, I was um, working in an ordinary television department, and we were faced with the issue of, my name is Peter Armstrong, if I didn't mention it, um, faced with the issue of this anniversary of the Doomsday Book coming up. What should we do? Oh, let's make a television series. Okay, we could do that. But then it just sort of, I thought, well, if we were to have a Doomsday Book now, how would we do it? Um, how could we actually use the evolving media to create and express the life of Britain in the 1980s? in a more multimedia, as we said then, way. And um, so from then on, it was really was an adventure, because the first thing was just on paper. If you take a map of Britain and, and cut it up into squares, how many small squares could you um, actually, what size of square would make sense to give a school to actually um, research? What would that look like on an analog television screen of the kind we've got? How many would it need? How many would fit on the side of a, a laser disc? 
what kind of software would be needed to move around it, what could we overlay on top of it on the analog picture of the map in terms of digital data. And so it was all on paper to start with, and would it work? And then, so I'm talking too long, so I will stop in a minute. And then, so my first thing was to go and talk to Andy Finney, who was the Mr. Laser Vision in the BBC, and had done the pioneering work. And so we had a lot of discussion about what you could do with a, a laser vision disk. And then, uh, you know, to cut a long story short, can we just get it, the data, the digital data into the blanking intervals? No, not much, a little bit. So could we actually invent a whole new thing that had a digital component on the disk as well? And that was really what made the thing possible, because without that, uh, you just have another laser vision disk, another laser disk, really. So the idea was, um, first of all, a huge technical challenge to create that kind of animal as the, the vehicle for us, and then the wonderful job of thinking, well, how can we involve more than a million people around the country in collecting data before the internet, before networking, before mobile phones? You know, you've just got a 35 millimeter camera and a, a BBC Micro as your basic tools, really. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we'll come back to both technical challenges and, as you say, the editorial challenges as well. Sitting next to you is Ruth Rosenthal. Ruth, what was your engagement? What was your involvement? Uh, well, I was, I was invited to um, be the editor of the pictures, the images. Um, I had no idea what that was going to involve. And my previous experience was that um, I'd worked at the Radio Times and been very heavily involved in the art department and the uh, pictorial side of that, so it's publishing media rather than broadcast media. Um, but I'd also edited a book by that time, hadn't I? On, I think that's why you asked me, on uh, BBC television, inside BBC television. Oh, right. Um, so I, anyway. Had so you were on the, on, the, on the content side? Yeah, absolutely. And then next to you is Paul Cunnell. You're from, you were working at Logica at the time, I understand, on the yes. technology side of things. Yes, I'd, I'd uh, joined Logica just out of college, so I was probably the most junior software engineer on the project. There was a team of people from Logica, there was sort of two halves to the software effort on the Doomsday project. Um, a lot of people doing a lot of work on what's called pre-mastering, the, the data generation. Um, and then there was a se separate team, as I say, which I was the junior member, um, which was designing the software that ran on the BBC Micro to access the data and present it to everybody. So this was the, the first proper piece of software that I got paid for writing. And, uh, oh. It was great fun. That's excellent. Thank you. And then last on our panel, uh, Stuart Atkins. Uh, yeah, I was working, running a research unit in educational broadcasting at the BBC and I saw an opportunity to apply for an internal secondment as a social science subject matter expert uh, for this project called the Doomsday Project. I had an interview with, with Peter, uh, which fortunately went well. Uh, I came away from it thinking this is kind of like my ideal project. It brings so many things I'm interested in into one place. And I kind of joined the project, I think it was about February of 1985. And I was responsible for the society and cult sorry, society and economy and some of the culture information on the national disc. I worked on most of the surrogate journeys with Andy and a whole bunch of other things along with Richard Tapper, who's here, who's the environment subject matter expert. And like you say, it was a huge adventure and it defined the rest of my career. Excellent. And I hope we'll come back to that in, in a way more comfortable. Now, I'm sort of assuming in this room that everyone is familiar with the Doomsday system, that we don't need to go into much detail about the discs and stuff like that. But if there are any points where Somebody says something you're not familiar with, just, just, just shout out, okay, even within this conversation. So, because it, it's like, we don't want to be, we don't want to go into, we don't want to do the educational bit, since you already know it, but we don't want to leave anybody behind either. And of course, that was sort of one of the, the incentives behind the doomsday system in the first place, which was to be as inclusive as it could be, to take people on that journey. And I wonder if, Peter, you could talk a little bit more about you said the idea came from thinking about the, 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 the Doomsday Book as a collection of, you know, this, this was a record of England in 1086. How did that translate for you? How did you get from that into quite a, a, a technology project like this? Well, I mean, if you're in the media, then you, you think about using as many bits of the media as you can 
to express whatever it is. So, you know, vellum and ink are probably not the media we were going to use. We were going to use everything was kind of available. And laser discs, and linking laser discs to BBC Micros was a new possibility, which brought in the idea of you know, pictures as well as text on that screen. And then you bring in audio, you bring in video, you bring in everything you can. Um, in but, order to do the same but, thing. But can I push you back a little bit? Even the idea that you would want to make this record, that, that it would be possible before you start looking for the technology to do it, mm -hmm. that's really quite a, a, a powerful and disruptive idea. In an organisation which, and having worked in it myself for many years, is not that fond of powerful and disruptive ideas unless they look like Saturday night television and have sequels. <laughs> well, I mean, I've... you can dance to Doomsday. Oh. <laughs> I think this is where you know you get danger of having uh, you know a golden view of the past. I don't think the BBC was as entertainment led then as it is now by a long way. So the idea of a rather we were in a department called Network Features that did pretty serious arts programming and um, historical programming. Um, and so the thought that if you wanted to really give a picture of Britain in the 1980s in a rounded way, you know Doomsday would love to have been able to do the original Doomsday would love to have been able to do. What are the tools you could now use? And there were other clues, like there was a big land sale <coughs> done in the 1930s, again by young people, you know, taking parcels of land all over Britain and, and going out and seeing what's growing there and what, what the land is used for. So we picked up that idea. And then the idea of a photographic montage of, of the whole country, then we're using satellite images so you could see it from above. It's all it's sort of early Google Earth stuff, really. Mm -hmm. But then all of that's on the community disc, one of the two discs, which is m much better known, but the national disc actually is in many ways even more interesting, because then it's, what, is, what, is the, what are the social factors about Britain in the 1980s? What books are people reading? What's happening to newspaper sales? The, you know, the start of AIDS uh, epidemic beginning. Uh, so many interesting things that could only be picked up by the work Ruth was doing with pictures, Andy was doing with videos, other people were doing by looking at stories that journalists were publishing, things being published in books and a huge amount of data from the University of Essex, of whatever it's called. Yes, I see. Thank you. Stuart can talk more about. Yes. And that this is where you get to the idea of data. You know, big data, we now all realise the importance of big data and the tools that can analyse it. We had middle-sized data, but it was a lot more than the original Doomsday, and we did have some tools to analyse it, how to map it, display it with different variables, um, and some interesting kind of ways in a very 8-bit ancient way. And if I could come to you, Paul, so the technology, I mean, we all, those of us who are old enough should cast our minds back to those dark days of 1982, 83, 84, and the technologies that were available to us. Now, I had just, I was, in fact, I was just graduating uh, in computing, and I remember one of my lecturers saying, I dream of a day when I'll have a whole megabit of RAM to work <laughs> with on my computer. The first work uh, job I had was a small software house in Cambridge, we used to run 16 users off 64 meg, I think. No, no, off, 64 off, off, K. 64K. It was just astonishing how, how limited the computing power was. When I worked at Acorn, I used to be a master on my desk, and I used to write programs in PostScript because the most powerful computer on the floor was the Apple Laser Writer. <laughs> <laughs> so you could work faster by sending a print job to do the calculations. That was, those are the constraints we worked in. Okay. So in that world, you saw a number of technologies that could be linked together. One of them, as you said, was the laser disc. Now, hmm. were you working on laser discs as part of this before this project, or was this something you. No, no, um, the, the laser disc aspect was completely novel because nobody had hooked a laser disc up to a computer in the, in the way that Doomsday Project was doing it. And, and one of the big challenges of the project was getting the bloody thing to work because it, everything was new. It was a complete new set of firmware that Philips were developing for the player. And, and in fact, you see the laser disc players have actually got an extra slice underneath them, which is where they put the electronics to handle all the data processing there. From, from the point of view of building software to retrieve that data, it was, it was presented to us at the application programming level in a reasonably digestible way. A video disc player looked like another sort of disc, uh, which you could address, you could read data from. There were a few extra things you needed to do in terms of 
manipulating the video, which pictures you wanted to put up, what mode you wanted the screen to be in. But from, as I say, from the programming point of view, the good thing about what all the work Philips were doing and Acorn were doing was present that to the, the team that was having to produce the retrieval software in a reasonably palatable way. Right. Again, it was, it was a good le level of abstraction, but the trouble with a level of abstraction is you can't see what's going on underneath and sometimes it didn't work. Okay. Yeah. Every, everybody was spending a lot of time fixing bugs, fighting bugs, getting things going. Yeah. I think another important thing as well is that the reason it's called LV-ROM, yeah. this is laser vision read only memory, is because one of the tricks that the project did that I don't think anyone had done before was to, because it's, laser disc is actually an analog technology, we store the digital data, 324 megabytes per side, in one of the audio channels. Right. So you, you, could have, you had addressable analog images, 54,000 still frame images, but you had the code that these guys were writing and all the data stored in an audio channel. Right, which represented itself as a as read-only memory yeah. to the application interface. Yeah, and then the BBC Micro, because it had been partly developed by TV engineers, allowed you to overlay mm -hmm. graphical data against an analog image. So you could pull off a, an analog map, for example, and you could overlay graphical data of a census distribution. Right, and you were then given. So when you got involved in the project, <coughs> were you aware of the capabilities of the system that you were trying to? Design for, or was the, were things changing as you were working? So as you acquired data, you were figuring out what you could do with it. It was a lot of it was evolving on the fly. So I, my experience of interactive video just prior to the project was work that the OU had done that I had access to because I was running a research team in educational broadcasting. But at that time, it was basically relatively crude interactive video. You could. You could, move, you could jump from different frames and you could see a little bit of copy overlaid. Nothing much more than that. So you got these new tools, and I noticed you nodding there again, Ruth, that, that, that things were shifting as you were working. No, oh, every day things were changing and one's understanding sort of grew a little, little bit or a lot or backwards, forwards. No. Right. So were you often surprised by what was possible or were you just annoyed by what, was, what the limits were? No, it was exciting. It was very... It was very exciting. You could, you know, the world was our oyster, really. It seemed it was you know, nothing. Nothing was too, too small or too big to take on. So, so what were some of the things that, you, that, that became possible that you, you realised you could use to advantage? <coughs> um, well, as we kind of acquired some of the data that Peter was talking about earlier, we created this wonderful sequence, which now you kind of think, take for granted through things through Google Earth and stuff like that, where you could zoom from a satellite image, um, which um, Richard and I negotiated access to all this remote sensing data. You could zoom down through that, through aerial photography that we then also went out and bought and negotiated, through six layers of ordnance survey maps that had all been Rostrum camera by the OU. Sorry, we, sorry, sorry. So these were, these, these were photographs of physical maps? Yeah, so all the different ordnance survey maps were physically Rostrum over <laughs> months and registered <laughs> so they could then be accessed by the software. And that was the analog images that then the, the digital data that schools collected in those four by three kilometer grid square blocks, which was then processed on the ARC Info GIS system at Birkbeck and what have you, that got overlaid. And you could literally do this zoom down to your street and see what kids had written about your street. Now we take that for granted now, but this was 1986 yes. on largely analog technology that we kind of did. Well, and you think about it, the, the resolution of the computer graphics on the BBC Master would never have got anywhere near displaying those images. Mm -hmm. The only reason you've got high quality images is because they were photographs. And, and that comes back to, to this point that it was, it was an, an analog and digital, it was very much a hybrid project. Was that something you envisaged right from the start? Yes, I mean, to actually, as I said, the first weeks talking to and rather well, how this might work, involved basically cutting up maps. I mean, I had a lot of uh, Ordnance Survey maps, which I've now destroyed, by cutting out squares of different sizes, photographing them and seeing what size, obviously you're looking for a 4 by 3 shape on television screen those days. Um, you know, what kind of, can you read the captions of this size or that size? How many levels could we do? And how would it work? And so physically photographing cut up maps is how it started. And then that turned into an industrial level. Um, operation of the OU photographing those maps very, very accurately. 
And we had some oddities, didn't we? The edges of the maps, I seem to remember some things that didn't quite fit. Or... Oh, I think where the roads line up. Yeah. Because of different cartographers and to, because the, the maps on screen didn't always correspond with the boundaries of the maps themselves. Yeah. And if you think about, certainly with a, a one inch map, the width of a road on the map is much bigger than the real width. And sometimes the cartographer would put the road to the left of its real position, sometimes in the middle, sometimes to the right. And just <laughs> once in a while, they didn't meet. <laughs> okay, so there'll be a, 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 te a, a quiz later where we go around and, and find places where the maps don't meet. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me come back then to, 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 to the map. Because the map was the center of the project in your original conception. Yes. Did you ever imagine doing it any other way? No, that seemed, no, that was, that was the thing you visually most wanted right. as, a, as a framework within which to see all the data, whether it's distributed census data, whether it's one particular photograph, where is it? Whether it's a piece of writing about a school, where is that school? How do you, I've seen that school, who's next door? Oh, I see, we move over there. So moving around, over mixing information with image, um, that, no, that was the basis of the whole thing. Sorry, there's a question from the audience. To that point, did you look at the original Doomsday Book for an inspiration? Um, no. <laughs> it's not very Mac based. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, yeah. that's true. Well, we could have done a much simpler Doomsday Book <laughs> without the maps, but maybe yes. Because I don't think anybody else was thinking in that way. And do you think this is because you came from a television, a visual background? You need you, you sought a strong visual metaphor that would be the guiding principle for, for all of the data you wanted to bring in. That's a very kind thought. Maybe it was that. I, I don't know. It's just it's just how it happened, and uh, it was all about numbers. You know, how many how many frames are there on a disc? How many maps? What size is what, what resolution? Could you see on a television screen? Would it actually work? And then, of course, we discovered it wouldn't work on one disc. We had to have two sides. <laughs> right. So, but with two sides, it did work by a miracle. Um, so, so the numbers were right, the resolution was right, the maps were available, and, and we just said the technology could be built. Yeah. I, I mean, you said that you were a junior programmer, so I'm sure yeah. you weren't involved in, in the high-level meetings. But this was quite a significant investment from, from both Philips as a hardware manufacturer who wanted to try to build this system. I mean, yes, we, 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 we were lucky in that we had a very good specification and I've spent the rest of my career building software for all sorts of other firms, including quite a few investment banks. And actually having a specification which goes into a reasonable amount of detail about how, how it should look, how it should work, is very helpful because, again, the, what we were creating was... There were no models for it. Nobody got something to say we like something that looks like that. Mm -hmm. All of this was being made up on the fly. Right. So the specification was a big help. It, and, and also, as I say, I was, I was the junior, junior guy on the team. I was doing mostly what I was told. Um, we had some very good software engineers on that team, particularly um, Jardine Barrington Cook was... The, the sort of key architect of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and also Nigel Young ran the project extremely well. I mean, again, I've, I've run lots of reasonably disastrous software projects in my time. There is definitely Hands a knack <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to making that work. There, there's always a little bit of give and take. Um, there, there was negotiation because it was a fixed price project. And so Logica were contracted to deliver that specification. <clears throat> but Again, it was impossible to know at the beginning of that how it was all going to work out, how the, the machines were going to actually operate. Right. But, but again, it was, a, it was a great example of some sort of collaborative work where there was a bit of give and take on both sides. And if you're from your side, say, Stuart? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there were lots of movable bits, but as Paul said, there was a, quite a good specification to kind of work with. Um, but one of the beauties was there was room to kind of flex. I mean, in today's parlance, you might have sort of said it was a, it was kind of a bit agile in the way it worked, even though we, we didn't have an agile methodology because it didn't exist there. But there was that kind of interplay. Um, and there was a, a very kind of strong and, and sort of uh, 
uh, editorial board full of the kind of great and good of various professors and academics and other people that gave us steerage as well. So everything that we were kind of doing was validated in a number of ways. Some of it was technology based and some of it was validated in terms of kind of culture and other areas. Right. So, so Peter, you were then holding all of this together. Yeah. Can I just say something about that, which is by way of a tribute, really, because it's such a privilege to sit in the middle and be able to actually call on, because we had a reasonable budget, because the BBC wanted to back it for some bizarre reason, be able to call on such outstanding people from anywhere. So we could second people from the BBC you know, with a process of you know, advertising and everything else, but some brilliant people from within the BBC. We could go to companies like Logica, some of the great, and we could go to specialists, we could go to Acorn, we could go to Philips. We had a wonderful time in Ireland talking to the research engineers there. Could it be done? Well, maybe let's try. And we went for the first test. Yes, we got some data off this. Um, so it was a real privilege of feeling, which I guess you can't normally do, that you could actually pick some of the very best and most interesting and innovative and creative people from these different fields. And then um, um, research machines were involved as well. And, some, and then, as you say, a lot of academics, some superb academics from the human geography and physical geography field, mostly. Um, so it's a real tribute to the quality of, of the people um, it worked within the BBC and in the surrounding uh, and, and Bruce, you then had to populate. You had to find the data that would, that would uh, the pictures that would actually work for people. What well, was I, that? What was that process? Well, I had a team of um, I think five or six people working with me, who uh, carved up subject matter or whatever it was. And we also had to deal with all the school material. I had to edit that down, which was very mixed and uh, tricky, really. Did you manage the school engagement, or did you just take what came from it? We had to take. We didn't have time to manage it. We had to. <laughs> the roof ran a, a, ran a national our photographic competition oh, that really? generated six thousand images as well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I think you more or less invented a barcode system, didn't you? I don't know how common that was in those days. So everything was very cleverly barcoded. So it okay. yeah. in. So, 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 just, just clarify to me. So. You've got the schools providing the imagery for, for, for their, their blocks. Yes. You've got the, the national disc as well, but you working on the imagery for that. So what sort of team did you have to, to manage all of this? I don't know how we achieved it, actually. I mean, it was just... Um... Nobody got a lot of sleep. I think <laughs> no, yeah, nobody got a lot of sleep. It was very exciting. I used to sleep on the I printout think... under the table. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ruth had about 15, at maximum, I think you had nearly 15 picture researchers. Well, I have a brilliant <laughs> <laughs> And presumably these were analogue images coming in that then yeah. had to be photographed yeah. or... Well, they had to be filed, they had to be yeah. organised. Right. Yeah. Phys they are physical objects. Physical objects, objects yeah. You see, we forget be... when images used to be physical objects. Yeah. And some of them, I mean, the schools project was really very, very mixed. <clears> I mean, 35, we're asking for 35 millimetre slides. And what we got back was, I mean, such a mixed quality of material. Dreadful. Some of it was just impossible. You yeah, couldn't. You couldn't read what they were. What they were showing. Right. So this is the famous unseen doomsday B disc of all the stuff that they rejected, <laughs> <laughs> which only two copies exist. <laughs> but on the A disc side, Ruth, you you managed to yeah, I mean, rope in the, some amazing photographers. We got we got some of the best photographers um, submitting that. Well, I. I bludgeoning them into padding <laughs> over their you know, best bits of their work, which I would select, and we were able to offer them a grand fee of one pound a piece. So Martin Parr mm -hmm. and the likes of handed over their work, quite reluctantly sometimes, I have to say, but they did hand it over. So, so how, what do you say to... Martin is famously relaxed, well-mannered, not at all curmudgeonly. I mean, what, how, how do you persuade someone like that? What well, it, was, it wasn't difficult. I mean, you know, if you're working on a, an exciting project like this, and you're part of the BBC, as you well know, you knock on most doors and most people open the door and welcome you and, and are happy to be part of it. There's another thing, so if I can just please, which people like the idea of this being a kind of deposit in, in the ground for future generation in another thousand years. So I think the idea, could your pictures be put in this for future generations to see, I think was quite attractive to people. I don't right. think they felt exploited, particularly. Mm. I mean, some of them were a bit, you know, it's obviously their living. But, yeah. uh, they're, they'll always go for as much money as they can get. Of course. Yeah. But, but, so that sense of it as being sort of, sort of the, the, the national memory and something that will be around, yeah. I think that even while you were developing the project, because of course this is before... They bought into it. People right. bought into it. Mm. 
it was certainly part of the way we sold in, whether it was data we were trying to buy or images or whatever it was, this whole idea that everybody's kind of pulling together with this collective vision. And I think because we thought before the price of the systems escalated beyond belief that we were democratising data was a phrase that we used to, to, used to kind of talk about, that somehow we were creating this thing which would go to schools and libraries and everybody would have access to it for as long as, you know, time went on, really. <laughs> Well, we're still here, 33 yes, years indeed. later. Yeah, well, and, and so far it's working, you know. People still have access to a lot of it, they're still talking about it. They may have to come to say, it's not in every school, but it will return. <laughs> so you get to the point where you're, you're, you're building the system, and say so you're from a social science background yourself. What were you trying to achieve there, for, particularly on, on the national disc, in terms of people's understanding of... Written in 1986. What, what were your research goals, and what was your? We wanted to try and give them as comprehensive a view as possible. Was one thing, so as broad a range of data, um, but also to give them the opportunity to interrogate the data. So I think that was one of the again revolutionary things. We used to talk about the bouncing bar charts. Yeah. So as well as all the mappable data, we had all this um, multivariate data, which was largely processed by. So, yes, so, so the British Social Attitudes Survey, British Crime Survey, um, the census data that wasn't the mappable data, um, the, some of the environmental data that Richard worked on as well, about kind of species distributions, about um, rates of pollution and, uh, and all those sorts of things. And you could, as a user, you could then go in and select which way you wanted to run your cross down and decide, okay, what do I want to have on this axis and that axis? and see the results. And so to be able to kind of play out all these what-if scenarios mm -hmm. was a really powerful thing, we felt. And, that, and that's one of the things. It was almost like saying we want to educate people about the power of data. Yeah. And how you think about what's happening today mm -hmm. with you know, what constitutes truth and does anybody believe you know, the official sources. In those days, we had a very kind of strong view that we could somehow empower people through giving them access to stuff that, normally speaking, they wouldn't have had access to. And you're giving them access to, to say, some data from reputable sources that they can then work with themselves. I mean, this is about the time when VisiCal was out. Yes. The idea of the spreadsheet had emerged, mm -hmm. but most, you know, certainly school children, the sorts of people would have access to it and would not be using such things. How much influence do you think that had on people in terms of their understanding of how they could you know, work with and manipulate data going forward? I think um, because the penetration wasn't as high as we would have hoped, mm -hmm. that the influence was possibly not as great as we'd liked it to be. I think that it generated ideas for people, and the people that did get to use the system, and something that we built as an add-on later on called Data Merge, which is knocking around here somewhere that um, Graham and I kind of worked on, which allowed you to then take your own data and merge it in with the Doomsday right. stuff and continue to let the picture evolve. They were quite powerful things for the time. I mean, I wonder if you know, you know there's the famous story that everyone who went to see the Sex Pistols play in Manchester then went off and formed a band. Whether everyone who saw this on Doomsday went off and became a data scientist. In other words, that it might have been a relatively small number of people, but it was quite inspirational because given the capabilities of the other systems that were available to people at the time, the elements that came together in Doomsday were really quite remarkable. I think the system was built with a very different sort of attitude to a lot of other computing that was going on then. It was very much piling, ask it some questions. They had free text queries or hierarchical. There were lots of different ways you could access that data. And, and it was very much built so that people could go and stroll around and find things. You know, even there's a you know, the gallery even on the National around. List, you yeah. could actually <laughs> walk around. Um, but it, it, that, I think, was quite innovative as well. I think that's probably Again, people who've seen the system are, are always struck by how it's it's all there. And, and Andy's worked and, a lot and on copyright. It sort of encourages yeah. you to go and play. Yes, yeah. mm. and, and that that model of yeah, and, and it was it's an environment within which you explore, mm. not a program that you run. Mm. And that seems to be it. It does feel like a perfect storm though that, that you had <clears throat> the BBC, as you say, investing not just a lot of money but almost it's it, it, you know. The BBC's values in this project, you won that fight internally. Acorn, um, you know, famously created to 
Uh, logic are doing the work, but it sounds like you cared. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a contract that you were doing for money. It was for something no, no, that people thought to get on the project. Right. And, 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 and I mean, every, I mean, I think another thing about how the project was run, it worked very well because everybody was crammed into this ghastly office building in Ealing, but everybody's working from... Built in house. Yes. <laughs> Not much cool that anymore. <laughs> but everybody was working together, and, and again, um, probably executive what, what, one of the key things about um, agile development is the users get to see what's going on at an early stage and can help evolve that. And yeah. I think when you're sitting right next to the people <clears throat> producing the content, it really helps inform <coughs> The design of the system and how how keen you are to make it work. Yeah, and I know that sort of the, the conversation about sort of the, the innovations that, 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 that when there we, we we talked about mapping. Uh, you mentioned search, and that that was really quite sort of distinctive. Wasn't it, was, it? it was pre Google, but it was free text search. You could just type mm -hmm. in what you're interested Nearly in. Nearly everything was pre Google. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, do you know what's outside this room? Mm. Almost everything. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, but there's so many things that have, yes. that have become very but, popular. But, but what and very was special mainstream. about the search? Um, it, was, it was innovative. It was you know, Martin Porter was the, the guy that wrote both a lot of the, um, the indexing management and the, um, it's, it's called the Porter algorithm. It's, it's a way of stemming, stemming words, t taking the essential part of the word, which will then find the thing that you're interested in. But in order for that to work, you have to tag everything. Was that part of your responsibility, Ruth, to label everything? Or would you just passing it on to be labelled? Oh, that's a tricky question. It was, we had an indexing team. Yeah, yeah indexing it was a great team. indexing yeah. team. So David Lee, yeah. who was, had been the chair of the British Indexing Society and had previously run the whole Fiction Library. He was incredible. He, he basically headed up a team that divides all the indexing. Mm -hmm. And then it was literally, everything was indexed by keywords. Right. So it was a, a, a control taxonomy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and we created that top-down taxonomy was an interesting exercise in itself. So that's where the economy, society, culture, um, yeah. environment mm -hmm. headings came from. And then we, we organised all the national content in terms of that taxonomy. And David and his team created that mammoth index. Right. And, th and that was one of the reasons that the retrieval software looks like it's working quite quickly, because it's not doing that much, because it's got this massive index that it can mm -hmm. look at to be able to find relevant articles. That used to take the VATS about a week to process right. to, right. so to generate the data that then got put on. So lots of pre-work was done, which then made the BBC, the BBC Master look like it was doing a pretty smart job sensible way of doing it. It's like autocomplete but less irritating. So, and then there was also um, the crowdsourcing element of this, which was really quite innovative. And if, if anything has been done on that scale of asking so many school, getting so many schools involved, getting so many school children involved. Does anyone? I don't remember. Does anyone remember the people still doing? I can't, I can't find it. No, no. even remotely. Blue Peter appeals, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think in one sense, possibly mass observation, certainly in terms of yeah. the, yeah. the text. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. If people are familiar with mass observation from the 1930s, and people asked to complete diaries, but he would do something. Still like, going? Yeah. Indeed, on, on quite a short time scale, won't you? I mean, how mm. long did the schools have? I don't remember, but not. It was quite so, difficult, yes. It was about so a term. It was weeks, one term. Weeks. Weeks. Yeah. I had to get it in by some, you know, I can't remember. It coincided yeah. with the work to rule by the teacher or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had, I think they had a term. So the software went out to all the schools in the UK, of which I think at the time there were about 28,000 primary schools and about 5,000 secondary schools. I only know that because I ran the educational broadcasting research unit. But there was a whole team that managed that. And we, had, we gave them a term. But because of the strike and other things, and not, not every no, four by right. three kilometre grid square block got taken up. We then sent the software to girl guides groups, scout groups, and women's institutes to do a kind of topping up exercise. That's right. And this well, software right. was running on a BBC microphone. Yeah, yeah. delivered on a floppy disk yeah. with some instructions. And they ran that and they filled in the fields basically. And right. the RM. RM had it as well, didn't they? But research machines. So there was, a, there was a PC version that went alongside the Acorn one. Right. There was a problem with London, particularly, because London used Sinclair Spectrums Maybe. and there was no way of doing the data transfer with the Spectrum because they didn't have any, well, didn't have any way of doing it. And that's why there are gaps in London. 
Thank you. Okay, somebody, yeah. Okay. As ever, there are so many standards out there. Yes. So, many to choose from. So we've got the crowdsourcing of the wiki, we've got the, the, the mapping idea, and you mentioned this idea about zooming down, which is something you'll become very accustomed to. We've got search, and then there was virtual reality uh, and the walkthroughs. Was that something which was in the original conception? Was it no, this is Andy's speciality, and he'd shown us some great work done in America on this, which we really loved, and then we worked out how we could do it. I have to say we did it better, because we had a full 360 and halfway and... Actually, you showed it to me. It's the, it's the Aspen movie map that was yeah. made by MIT, and you can see that online. So, so the Aspen movie map allowed you to move frame by frame through a photographically captured environment. Yes. And that then became the inspiration for something, and you sourced a number of these virtual tours. We did, I think, 10 or 11. So as a social scientist, I kind of advised on, the, on ones that would represent different types of housing, actually. Um, and Richard advised on the kind of the environmental one. So we shot um, a stone cottage in Cornwall, um, a terraced house in Port Sunlight, a stockbroker one in Beaconsfield, a high rise which was Trellick Towers, uh, the whole of Brecon is a market town, a forestry area in um, Dumfries, and Dumfries, the whole of a farm in Norfolk, um, and uh, Newcastle. Newcastle, there was a couple more. Yeah. And we literally, with Andy, we would go in and we'd shoot eight pictures on a, on a point, move a few feet, another eight pictures, we would open the drawers and take pictures, and all of this stuff was indexed. And if we shot in someone's home, the nightmare for the copyright team was everybody had to sign copyright forms, all the schools did. But everything we shot in the background, we had to get releases from. So if there was a like Kellogg's cornflakes packet oh, in the background, we had to get some kind of release form for stuff. We, gave, we actually gave up on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and okay, let's 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 move into the. Uh, I was hoping to stay away from copyright because it gives us all nightmares. But this was clearly <laughs> clearly an important aspect of what was going on, which was that she was saying what you were doing was so new that it surely wasn't clear what the rights framework or rights position was for almost anything. Because it's, being, it's not being presented in the broadcast medium, it's not being presented in print, it's, it's, this is 1986, people are not accustomed to screen-based delivery. How did you begin to negotiate all of this? He asked Tom, mm -hmm. Tom is the man over there. <laughs> <laughs> but you made Tom do it. Yes. Well, I'd like to think that it was a success, but... The first thing to do was to define what the question was that we were trying to answer. Um, and I guess there were two problematic areas. One was how Ordnance Survey was going to react. Mm -hmm. And I remember at least two meetings with the executives, the Ordnance Survey executives, who were certainly uh, uncomfortable with the possibilities that Doomsday opened up to users as a substitute for the maps themselves. And I can't, I mean, I can't remember why it was that in the end they agreed to do it, but they did. So that was, that was one problem, and that was solved. I mean, there was good license, uh, Drafted, which I think everybody was satisfied with, including Ordnance Survey. I think I can answer that question for you, Tom, if, okay. if the rumour I heard is correct. I think somebody pointed out to them how many paper maps the schools would buy in order to do the surveys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I thought of that. <laughs> the, the, the other problem, which I don't think was actually solved, Though we found, I mean, the school children were all of them underage, so they weren't confident to contract to authorizers to use their material. Um, that was basically an insoluble problem. Uh, what we did, as far as I remember, was we insisted that their teachers signed a release form. Now, I'm sure that if anyone had ever challenged us, that simply wouldn't have stood up. The alternative, which we did consider, 
was getting in touch with the parents because they said they would have been authorized to do it, but that was ruled out because it was going to take too long and some people might refuse. So in the end, we did have a solution if somebody asked us, you know, what, how, how come you're using all this material? We did have an answer, but it wouldn't have stood up for a second in the court of law. Never came. And, 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 so that's a beautiful example of how the BBC can sometimes be one of the most creative organisations in the world, not on screen, but in terms of there's a process, enough people will be convinced by the fact that the, BBC, the process has the BBC blocks on it, not to question it too much, and let's just move on, and by the time it becomes an issue, we'll have moved into something more interesting. It's called yeah. Best Endeavours, isn't it? Best Endeavours. <laughs> I suspect there was a lot of that in this project, which you're now free to talk about. <laughs> I mean, there must have been times when you were challenged from above by what was going, about what was going on and what risk this was and things like that. Mostly financially, though. Right. Because um, we had a monthly report back to the BBC bosses and in particular to BBC Enterprises who put in the money had been put in by Philips, Acorn and BBC Enterprises and the Department of Education, sort of a four-way thing. And uh, we thought they got value for money and it would have been terrific if Philips had ever sold it at the right price uh, at the end. But anyway, it was a constant problem as to um, uh, keeping within that admittedly good budget uh, as we had new ideas and new things we wanted to do. And so we reported back and there were a lot of arguments about that. And particularly, I have to say, with BBC Enterprises, who were the ones always saying, are you sure you're going to sell these? Because they were the only ones really wanted to return in terms of the, the discs right. as opposed to the hardware. And uh, they were not convinced, I think, they were going to get a return, and indeed they didn't. <laughs> so I think the other, the other big yeah. challenge that happened fairly early on was that Acorn effectively almost went bankrupt. So from a, from a financial point of view... They, they no longer became a kind of key player that threatened the project. And there was another kind of creative solution to that, which was we applied to the European Commission for funding through what became known as Project 901, an Esprit project, yeah. which we got money from them, that then allowed the project to kind of carry on under the auspices of that. And so there was additional funding, but an additional overhead. Right. And we then had to report into not just enterprises in the BBC boards and our own editorial board, but there was a, a reporting line into the European Commission. Right, so yet again, the Normans came to the system to do the Can I pick up an earlier point, yes, if I may? You talked about the virtual walks, yes. and you talked about indexing. We tried a thing to bring the two together by creating a virtual gallery, mm. which you could walk around, and which there were pictures and um, things that would represent all the different parts of the system. So you could go into a gallery about the environment, and look at birds and this and that and the other. Um, and um, it, was, it was fun because you also had doors. So you could go out of a door into the real world through someone's house in Beaconsfield, let's say, walk around the house, and in a certain place outside the house, you'd see this, this same door, which actually took you into the virtual world of the gallery, another kind of virtual world. Um, so that was terrifically fun, and that was another innovation, I think. But equally, I think we decided it was a failure. Because essentially, if you want to find out about birds, it's much, much quicker to put the, the words in and search in other ways right. than actually think, well, I'm in the politics room. How do I get to the environment when we're through here, this corridor? Turn left, <laughs> over there. And so it seemed a lovely way to do it, and maybe some children enjoyed it. And it was good visually to show off. We put it on the front of a national disc because it was such a beautiful, very early piece of... It was Mike Oldfield's Bosch computer, I think, he used to generate it, wasn't it? Cool. Um, he didn't but, know it had been used on one of his videos. Yeah, yeah but it was a failure. Mike Oldfield's computer, really. But as a concept, it was a failure. Mm. Um, okay. Failure. Mm. Okay. What it did was, though, offer a vision of how you might navigate through a virtual space yeah. with physical constraints. Yeah. It may not have worked for the index data that you had. You know, but did eventually show fruition in things like Second Life and stuff like that. Yeah, so, absolutely. again, I think it's it's not that there's a direct line of inspiration from the things you were doing on Doomsday to this, and the developers of these things are sort of those. Although there is, I understand, quite a lot of your prior art in there in terms of patenting and things like that. It's more that 
you were, as a team, having ideas that were, were of their time, but it took 20, 30 years of technological innovation, particularly in processor speeds, the emergence of the internet, graphics resolution, to make them something that was totally compelling and available to everyone. Um, it, it, I'm reminded of um, a time I met Morris Wilkes, uh, who wrote the, built the EDSAC in Cambridge in 1949. And I asked, this was in about 2005, six, and I asked Morris what surprised him most about modern computers. And he said, their reliability. Yeah, and the, 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 the Intel processor in my desktop machine has run hundreds of billions of operations in the time we're sitting here, and it hasn't broken once. <laughs> and then I said, when you built EDSAC, did you understand the you know, symbolic manipulation and all those things that the thing can do with computers? And I said, yes, we knew what was possible. We could imagine it. We just couldn't do it because the systems are not powerful enough. And it feels very much as what we see in Doomsday is what a group of enormously creative people with adequate resources could create on the technologies of the day, and sometimes bringing in new technologies, as you mentioned, with LV Rhombus' specification, to take it to its absolute limit. And, and that, I think, is, means that there's, it's not that it was a failure in that it didn't work, it's that the time was not right for a lot of these innovations. Um, one, sorry, Ruth, please. No, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to think about doing what, what it would be like to do it today? You know, what, that starting yeah. point. Could we do it you know, much better, much faster, more interestingly? I don't know. I yeah, if you, if you were doing it from scratch, yeah. what would be the things that yeah. you would want to bring in? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've been really taken by this point because um, even when you raised it earlier, because that was the whole point. I would constantly say to people, but what's it for? And he would say, oh, don't ask me for two last night. I don't know. I have no idea. And I think that was the jewel. The fact that people didn't really know. So when you actually tried to tie it down like the gallery wall, then of course it didn't work for that. But that was really the point. The point is it isn't utilitarian at the time. Nobody actually had a clue. Just like the internet, the web. I mean nobody had a clue where that was going mm -hmm. at that time. It didn't matter. Luckily, these guys were privileged enough to be able to do something without somebody standing on top of them going, yes, but did it do this, otherwise we're going to shut you down. The fact that it was open to all this creativity meant that they could spark off all kinds of things. Yeah. And if only people <coughs> trust you could do that more often. That's, 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 that's a very good point. And I, and I think we should move away from the self-congratulations and say, <laughs> so it was far too expensive. Nobody bought them and it just rotted away. So, <laughs> 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 it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the painful reality. Oh, well, can I, I was going to offer a different problem. Please do. No, no, no. The different, different problem is, I think, from the BBC point of view and from many users, that there's no storyline. Mm -hmm. um, you just say to me, well, there it, you know, the, the disc starts with the question, what do you want to know? And so, uh, well, where do I start? So, well, I know, I'll go to my house, as everyone does. Go to where I was born, look a little bit at where I was born. But after that, it's entirely up to you what you want to research, what questions you want to ask the data might be able to answer. There isn't a built-in storyline. But that's like an encyclopedia, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it is the nature of the beast, but it, it's also a huge limitation. And, so I think if one was doing it now, you know, for example, in the, the environmental crisis we're in now, I would love to do a global version of this with input from, we're sort of doing a little bit of that at the moment, but it really would raise the question, well, what's the story, you know, why? This is all the information about everything that's happening in the world environmentally. Please. Well, where do I start? I think there's two sides to that. One is, yeah. that's the internet now. There's no story to the internet. It's yeah. whatever you want it to be. Yeah. But we also did, if you remember, we did explore an idea afterwards of having the deconstructed documentary. The idea that you, a documentary is kind of like a distillation to 40 minutes. There's a whole bunch of background stuff that never makes it into that 40 minutes. <coughs> we had this idea of producing mm -hmm. these discs, which would allow you to have the documentary, but then to delve deeper into the underlying data and to be able to explore all those things. It, it didn't, in the end, come to fruition. I can't remember why, but... We did yeah, one those are the things that, yes. Yes. We did a test with Douglas Adams. But, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I, somebody was mentioning this earlier that, that there was a, somebody did a walkthrough with Douglas Adams yeah. and recorded yes. it. We did, yeah. yeah. I did, yeah. Right. 
And was that an attempt on your part to, to provide a story exactly. through the Exactly. Theory? To, you know, to say to suppose, people in schools, this is the kind of way you could use it, and this is the kind of fascinating storyline that you could journey that you could have. And so Douglas made a journey just off the top of his head, really, about oil and oil spillages and things and exploring things. And he was, of course, brilliant. But um, we thought we'd do a whole sequence of those, which we didn't ever do. Well, thank you. And so thank you to Peter Armstrong. Ms. Rosenthal, Paul Cunnell, and uh, Stuart Atkins, and to the other members of the project team who have come this evening, uh, all of your insights as well. It's been great uh, talking to you, and thank you for sharing with us tonight.